This is every way to become the richest player on your Minecraft server. If you're feeling dirt poor, that's actually a good thing. Since with just one block of dirt, we're gonna be able to turn that into riches. And the whole reason for this centers around mud. Since if you were to use a glass water bottle to convert a dirt block into mud, then you can dry that out over dripstone and slowly turn it into clay blocks. Which when you break that down, you can use the clay to be traded with villagers to get yourself infinite emeralds and then trade that with a toolsmith or an armorer. And there you go, you've got diamond armor and diamond tools. Not just enough to kit yourself out, but also to kit out everyone else on the server. And you did it all just for playing around in the mud. Following this advice from iCraftMC, all we have to do is kill one skeleton, and that could be enough to get us full netherite. Since when you kill that one skeleton, you can use the bones that it drops to give yourself bone meal, use that on the ground, give yourself as many seeds as you can, and then plant those seeds and gather wheat. Which we're then gonna use to breed sheep, craft those into beds, and now we'll be able to mine for ancient debris in the nether. You know, You'll just have to do it carefully. As Metward shows off in this video, we can use a village to turn ourselves into the strongest player on the server. And when I hear that, I also hear that we're gonna be the richest player on the server. Because let's be honest, money is power. And the advice here is great. Like stocking up on leather and spruce saplings before you even find yourself a village. That way, we'll have plenty of things to be able to trade ourselves with the different villagers that we're finding. And then, after making ourselves a couple of beds and a villager breeder, we'll not only be able to turn some of them into fletchers for emeralds, but we can also get librarian villagers to get all the enchantments that we need whenever we want them. I mean, come on, Fortune 3 is great, but Fortune 3 every single time that you want it, that's gotta be even better. And even if you do follow their advice to become the strongest player on the SMP, it's gonna be easy to be the richest if you're also killing off anyone who's poorer than you. Kind of a rich get richer sort of situation. Through the help of villager trading, we're clearly already able to get so much of the diamond gear that we would need. But where do we get the actual diamonds? Let's face it, you can't make a block out of diamond pickaxes. So in light of that, here's where we gotta build ourselves a machine to specifically get diamonds. And that's where this tunnel bore comes in. Now to get this started, you are gonna need a bit of ancient debris so that you're able to move this block without exploding the rest of the machine. But once you get that, I think you'll find you'll be able to make up the rest of your profits pretty easily. And stacking a few of these like carves did, you can get every diamond you'll need for the rest of your life or at least until the server resets. I guess whichever one comes first. And since you need a lot of diamonds for all the armor trims, this could help you out there too. I mean, it worked pretty well for Wreck Wrap. If you were still mining those all by hand, that series would have been lucky to have finished before the end of 2025. So uh, thank God for TNT duping. Ancient cities are a pain to loot. I'm not gonna peed around the bush there, but because they are such a pain to loot, it means that few people on the server are gonna wanna go down there regularly. And unfortunately for them, and fortunately for us, there's plenty of good loot that you can find down there. So as long as you remember the basics like to hold down the sneak key and bring along plenty of the wool that you got from earlier, we could easily loot all of the chests in this ancient city without even spawning the warden. And just from a bit of luck here, we're able to get the rare and exclusive armor trims, echo shards, music discs, Basically everything that you would see on the rarest items in Minecraft list, you could find it here. Minecraft elytras are tough to get until you get an elytra. And then at that point, it's a lot easier to get one. Especially when you could skip building up to the ship and just fly right in and steal the next elytra. So if you're able to get an early jump on getting over to the end cities, then that's your cue to monopolize the entire elytra trade to all of your friends. What'll make them even more desperate is the fact that finding these ancient cities, especially one that generates with an end city ship, can be a long process. And the pain of having to walk 10,000 blocks plus over this treacherous terrain, constantly bridging yourself past, they'll be willing to fork it up just to get an elytra. And then again, when they inevitably die in lava and need a new elytra. Or if you don't want to worry about going to the end for your monopoly, then it's worth noting that you could also set one up inside of the overworld. Now see, the elytras are the razors, we're gonna sell the razor blades, otherwise known as the rockets. Because once you get yourself a proper sugarcane and creeper farm for the gunpowder, you can easily supply the entire server for months. And they'll also be repeat customers. So as long as you price it just fair enough where they don't want to go and compete and build their own farms, then you could have a couple of people who are set up as dependent on you in the server. And at that point, it doesn't matter how much money they're making, at least some of it's gonna be coming back into your pocket. If getting rich is the name of the game, then in my opinion, how we get there is really open for interpretation. So if you're willing to play fast and loose with what qualifies as a rule, and you're playing in 1.17, pay attention to this duplication glitch. Since after filling up your inventory so that every slot has an item, then if you were to continuously rename your shulker box filled up with valuables until eventually you break the anvil, it'll drop not only your original shulker box, but also a duplicate, completely stored with all the valuables inside 
side. And folks, that's just one example of the many duplication glitches that seem to find their way into this game. It does not take more than a Google search to find a few. And we'll even put some on screen if you want to go dive deeper into that rabbit hole for yourself. Look, this is a video about how to get rich, not how to get ethical. Public goods are good for the public, but not so good for your wallet. So if you're the kind of person who likes to go around building a bunch of farms for the server to use, it would make sense that you took all the upfront risk in building it and all the materials to make it. You should get a little bit of a kickback from it. So if you were to just charge players for using your farms, or even something like the roads that you built within the nether highway, then just having a simple toll booth could be all that you need to get all your riches back. Just make sure that you also don't pay to use these farms. Then you'll not be getting rich, you'll just be getting scammed. If everyone's foolish enough to leave their stuff inside of a valuables chest and not a valuables ender chest, then really, that's their mistake. So to teach them a lesson of just how reckless that is, all we need is a hopper and a daylight detector. Since by setting it up just like this, we can have the daylight detector periodically siphon items out of their chest. And that way, they'll be a lot less likely to notice than if you were to have this happening all hours of the day. I mean, if they open up the chest and see it's completely empty, it might raise a few eyebrows. But open it up and there's a few diamonds missing, then they're probably not even gonna notice. And hopefully, they'll just fill it up with some replacements, all the while letting us siphon off the extras. For this one, we're taking a page out of Noah's book, except we're doing it a little bit more devilishly. Since we're gonna keep two cows for ourselves, we're gonna kill every other cow that we can find within a reasonable part of the world. So then, when your friend's desperately needing things like beef and leather, they'll be nowhere to find. And sure, you could go deal with hoglins and such, but really setting up a farm for one of those is a lot more stressful, especially early game. And at that point, we can keep our cows to ourselves, breed them in a secret location, and then sell off any leather-based good and become insanely rich. After all, it's a lot easier to monopolize the market when there's literally no market in sight left to be made. What's the most valuable thing in Minecraft? Now you might think the dragon egg or the elytra or even enchanted golden apples. The real answer is time. And let's be honest, no one on the server wants to go and waste their time to get all the obsidian that they need for their project. It's incredibly dull. Even if you have a haste 2 beacon and efficiency 5 pickaxe, this still feels like a traffic jam. But if you're a young upstart and you want to get a young startup, then taking the time to mine a bunch of obsidian from things like the end pillars could be an easy way to get players to pay up big. Minecraft redstone's a beautiful thing, but it's often got an ugly side to it. And it's no secret that a lot of the redstone features that we get used to are built around bugs, or exploits that later get patched out. So if you have a little bit of redstone know-how, you could charge your friend a big fee to go through and clean up their redstone circuitry. Think of it like buying the new iPhone every fall. Is it necessary? No. But can you charge a lot for it? Absolutely. And really, the more glossy things that you add to it, the better. It's all for show, folks. The thing was completely operational before, but it's all on how you market it. If your friend has a bad habit of dumping all their stuff into a chest and then never looking at it again, then that can often mean that they have a lot of stuff that they're just never using because they don't even know how to find it. So if you're the type that likes to organize, you could spend your time going through your friend's chest monster and turning that beast into way more of a beauty. And if you use a mod like Mouse Wheelie that literally just sorts it for you at the press of a button, that's even better. Just don't let them in on your little secret, all right? Gambling's a crooked business. And really, anything you're willing to gamble, you should just assume is lost. But while you and I know that, hopefully your friends don't. And so to teach them about the dangers of it, you can create a fake gambling mini game where you can trick your friends into losing their valuable stuff. So if your friend's stupid enough to put up a netherite sword on the line, then it's their fault when they find out that the game was rigged all along and you were always just going to be getting it from them. It was more of a donation box than a gambling machine. But hey, they should be happy. Donations are write-offs. Gambling isn't. So if anything, you're just helping them on their tax return. Creeper holes are like laundry. If you have a little bit to do, then it's not a big problem but let too much of it stack up, and all of a sudden you've got this huge undertaking to go. And so to prevent that from happening, and fill your pockets while you're doing it, you can charge players on the servers a tax for repairing their creeper holes. And when you do this, they really can't blame you for anything that you're doing. I mean, after all, they could've just not had the creeper explode in the first place, but if they then forget to fill it in themselves, then in my opinion, they should be paying a little something. If not their time, then their assets. And hopefully they'll learn a lesson going forward. And we can all have a much prettier server going as well. Dying in Minecraft is expensive. And while it gets easier to survive the longer that you're playing the game, it also gets more devastating when you do die, and now you have to spend all that time getting your stuff back. And that's why we can take a page out of Grian's book and create a shulker box that you can purchase for a high amount that gives you everything that you need if you happen to die. And I'll be honest, Grian's a lot nicer than me. He calls it perhaps you perished. I would be a little bit more cruel to my friends in the message for it, but the result's all the same. I mean, in the real world, we have a death tax for anyone who dies with a large amount of assets, so I'd say this is just another form of that. After all, who wouldn't want more taxes in their game? <laughs>
Normally, a lot of shops like to pop up around spawn. After all, it's where a lot of people spend their time. But where the real money's to be made is in the blue ocean strategy. So all the sharks that spawn fight over the little fish that are over there, turning the water red with violence. We can go off into the distance and set up many shops in awkward and far out locations that sell little conveniences. Think of these like your 7-Elevens. They're gonna have things like rockets, food, maybe extra ender chests. And then, here's the kicker, because we're selling these so far away from where they're supposed to be, we can charge a bonus on top of that for the extra convenience. After all, folks, time is money, and the only difference is that I can't buy a steak with time, so if I'm able to get my friend's money, I'll take it. While everyone else worries about getting rich off of diamonds in the server, there actually could be more benefits into building a gold farm. Now look, with things like piglin bartering and such, gold has many more uses than diamond. So if you're able to build an insanely fast gold farm like this one, then you can monopolize that gold quick, and all of a sudden you won't just look rich, but you'll also feel rich with all the other stuff that you're getting by purchasing through it. Hey, come on, an all gold beacon? Yeah, we can safely call that a flex for what it is. When you're just trying to kill mobs to get over to your base at night, then a lot of the mob drops just feel like junk and you'll throw them out of your inventory like such. But when you really do need these materials, those could be more valuable than just about anything else at your disposal. So building a proper mob farm to get a bunch of these mob drops like so could be all you need to make yourself essential for multiple different markets. If your friend has a rocket shop, they're gonna need gunpowder. They come to you. Or if your friend needs a bunch of string for dispensers and redstone, again, that comes back to you. Then they'll have the spiders at your farm to thank for that. And just about every plant farm that you're gonna be making needs some kind of bone meal. So if you have plenty of supplies of bone blocks from all the skeletons that you've been killing, then you very quickly got the market cornered on multiple different fronts. So if you got the time to build this design, you can easily become one of the richest people on the server, all through selling what would have been junk in everyone else's eyes. Bomb proofing is an essential business, but man is it boring to do. And while there's something therapeutic to walking around with light overlay and placing down torches, that might just be a me thing. I don't know if anyone else feels that. So if you're the same way, you could set up a business where you spawn proof for all the other people on your server. This could be especially useful if they don't just want you to spawn proof the surface, but also the caves underneath their base. That'll give them better mob returns and hopefully get you plenty of money as well. Pillager patrols are often a nuisance, but here's how to turn them into your greatest business partners. Since by building a raid farm out in the middle of nowhere, you can kill some time here and kill some pillagers as well to get yourself plenty of emeralds and totems. And we were already selling things for people in case they died, so why not sell them a preventative measure as well, also for the same hefty price. And then you're monetizing off of both parts of the plan, the prep and the contingency. But hey, when they really need it, they're gonna appreciate that they had both, even if they don't appreciate your pricing structure. Terraforming is a tough skill to learn, because in a certain respect, you're not supposed to build like a builder, but build like a world generator. And if AI has taught us anything, us humans and computers don't always think the same way. But if you're able to tap into those ones and zeros, then you could use that to add a bunch of zeros to your bank account. And taken after what Scar does on Hermitcraft, you could sell off your terraforming contract to be able to provide yourself with one, a fun project, and two, a hefty fee that you get to pay yourself, both of which I like. Here's how to make money, all the while saving your friends money. Villager trades are obviously a very helpful way to get ahead in the game, but converting those villagers over and over again with a zombie can get those trades even more valuable. And now you're not only saving your friend time, but you're also saving them with a lot of different costs that they would have accrued later on in life. And for that, you can charge them plenty of things. I would choose diamonds since they're not renewable. And with the villager changes as well, they're gonna be a little bit more useful too. And you'd have both. This is my super smelter, and with the size of it, you can probably guess that it does a pretty good job of smelting. And you would be right, but don't expect a 100% return. Since the truth of the matter is that with this super smelter, when I'm smelting my friend's items, I do give them their stuff a lot faster than they would have gotten it otherwise. There just might be a few of their items that got siphoned off in the process. Now we're not only getting paid the fee for using our super smelter, but also a few things that maybe got a little bit too overcooked in the process. After all, you wouldn't want to give them bad goods, we'll just hold those into our personal chests. Running a store is no easy task, and often between all the restocking, supply, and customer service, it's easy to get stressed by all the chores. So to take some of that off your plate, we might need to outsource this machine. As you can see with this design that T2 Studios and Rexstone laid out, it's possible to create a fully customizable shop that runs and operates out of just one single chest. And that means we can have our customer input the proper amount of payment and get the multiple items set that they asked for. And speaking as someone who's redstone illiterate, this blows my mind. But if it means I spend less time at the shop, I'll go 
gladly oblige. In the recent updates, piglin bartering has been a huge help to Minecraft, but if you don't have the best luck on the market, it can take a while. So in that case, building a piglin bartering machine like this is super simple to do, and it can save you a lot of time. The way it works is super simple. All you need to do is just fill the machine with gold and then press the button to let it work. And the way that it does it is super straightforward. All that happens is that a golden ingot will go onto the pressure plate, the piglin will pick it up, and then that'll alert the system to refill. Just like that, you got an endless cycle going and you'll be able to get the bartering trades going straight down into chest for your uses. Instead of trading with piglins for infinite obsidian, we're gonna use withers. Since this wild design, we use a combination of trapped wither bosses and nether portals to essentially create infinite obsidian as much as we want. It's hard to notice while we're using it, but from the outside, the way that this works is that every time that we go through the portal, it generates a new set of obsidian for the withers to break. And as they shoot towards these snow golems that are trapped away so they never hit them, they'll only ever break the blocks that we generate by being AFK. So while this is obviously dangerous to set up with not one, but two withers that could ruin the whole thing, when this machine gives you 3,000 obsidian per hour, it's an investment that pays off. Most of the time, when you get rich enough to have stacks and stacks of value blocks, you're not examining them too closely. Because let's face it, you're rich, you don't need to. So if you know someone who's reached that upper echelon of wealth, we may need to turn their ignorance into our bliss. And doing so is as simple as an anvil and some decoys. Since if we take something like yellow concrete powder and rename it to a block of gold, then even if you hover over it, it's hard to notice from a quick check. And as long as we don't leave any of the legitimate ones to compare and contrast, this subtle swap out should confuse them at the crafting grid. Building up an animal farm is a lengthy process, and it's an investment that usually pays off. But to keep those dividends from ending up in your neighbor's pockets, then a vindicator might be your best pick. Now, like this, they aren't as interested in the pigs as they are with us. But add on a Johnny name tag, and now they'll chop up just about anything in sight. Meaning, if we place one of these inside the fence and make it invisible, your friend will have no idea how they're losing all their mobs. At least, they'll have no idea until they step inside to check it out. And from there, we can successfully steal their stuff and their food stuff to make sure you stay on top. If you've ever taken the time to build a big project in survival, then you're well aware that certain blocks are pain to collect in bulk. And that's usually why things like quartz and prismarine are tough to justify when you're not in creative mode. So until you get some crazy farm to automate the resources, why don't we just fuel up from your friend's foundation? I mean, using those blocks on the floor seems like a waste, especially since they could be using half slabs instead. So for that matter, what if we gutted parts of their builds and replaced it for cheaper variants? That way, both of us get to use these blocks in our builds, and they won't even notice. Finding the ancient debris necessary to get netherite is a real hassle to do. And while sure, having plenty of beds and TNT to do that process does speed it up, what if you don't have a lot of resources? Well, if you still got a hankering for explosions, then you gotta build a TNT duper for netherite mining. Basically what we're doing is we're dropping TNT onto an obsidian platform and then using all of that new TNT explosion power to then explode further and further out into the mines. And while you are gonna have to look out for those pesky lava pockets, really, you're clearing out so many blocks of this anyway, they can just move it around and you won't even waste time. At some point, I'm sure you've seen one of these chests. The type where folks just dump any and all of their enchanted books in with reckless abandon. And while it's disorganized, that's a factor that we can use to our advantage. See, from this zoomed out view, all enchantment books look the same. Meaning, unless you hover over, you can't tell the difference between an efficiency 2 and an efficiency 2735. So to play this prank, we'll just be swapping out their high value books for level 1 enchant instead. And as long as they don't have a resource pack to visualize which is which, we should get by scot-free. Going AFK is a pretty common hack by this point. So common, in fact, that I bet that many of your servers have some kind of lazy someone on at all times. And while that's great for them, it can be somewhat frustrating for the rest of us, especially if we need 100% sleep percentage to pass the night. So to get back at that selfish someone, we can nab their profits for ourselves. And the best part is that stealing from an AFK player is just as easy as it sounds. And while I suppose you could kill them for some more free goodies, even just robbing the return chest from the farm that they're hanging out at should be more than enough. And it's a fair trade-off for what they've done to us. Sometimes you gotta spend a little to make a lot, and this is one of those cases. Now say you were to purchase or acquire a second account. Well, tell the server owner you'll be inviting a friend of yours to join, get them whitelisted, and then once you're on and playing as the new account, simply ask the more experienced players on the server for help and handouts. Odds are that they'll give you just tools and resources for free, all of which is worthwhile. And after you milk that pity, stash it in a chest, and then give some excuse why the new account had to stop playing, letting us get back on our main account and take our newly found gifts for us. Having a fully powered beacon is a big flex, and one entirely made a netherite is another level. But if your friend managed to secure one of these before you did, it's not worth letting them keep that kind of treasure. So in that case, we can devalue their greatest asset without them even noticing. See, since the beacon has so many layers, we have free reign to hollow out the innermost blocks and then cover up the shell to still leave them in the dark. Or if you're worried about any suspicion that might come when their haste 2 drops down to a haste 1, then just fill in the middle blocks with something less valuable like iron, and they'll be none the wiser. Here's how we're going to turn this librarian villager into an infinite emerald farm. Since after repeatedly zombifying 
mine and curing that villager, we're able to get it so that we can buy one bookshelf for one emerald. And then we can take that newfound bookshelf, break it on the ground, and that'll give us three books that we can sell back to it for one emerald apiece. And at that point, we're basically tripling our money every time we talk to the villager. And while that might seem like we're manipulating it, it's clearly got plenty of emeralds for itself, so maybe it's fine with sharing the wealth. When we talk about resources, we're usually picturing things like valuable minerals or maybe common building blocks. But folks, that's only scratching the surface. And if you want to get the best of your friends on the server, every little bit counts. So if they're foolish enough to leave enchanted items in a chest just standing there, whether at a farm or not, then why not take them out and put them through a grindstone instead? That way, we profit off the extra bits of EXP while they get left in the dust. I mean, it's something small enough where people won't care in the moment, but once we jump ahead to having a fully enchanted suit for ourselves, then they'll realize their mistake. If you've been playing Minecraft for a while, then the changes to ores in 1.17 definitely take some time to get used to. And I'll still find my friends smelting their silk touch doors instead of using fortune, which is unfortunate, but it gives us a golden opportunity. See, if you were to grab your friend's collected ores, whether out of a super smelter or a chest in the mines, then we can choose to use our fortune on it for a better yield. And after that, simply smelt the ones that they would have gotten anyway. Meaning if they're expecting a one-to-one -one return on their iron, they'll get as much. But that'll allow us to take the extras for profit. Here's why you should break your end portal. See, by using this trick, we can smash the end portal frames and turn our portal into a fully functioning duplication machine. And really, this isn't just for sand, but it'll work with any gravity affected block. So if you need a bunch of concrete powder, gravel, or whatever, this works quite well. Just make sure you have a collection system on the other end. Otherwise, it'll be a mess when you go through. If you're planning to build with copper, you need to have this farm. Since with this design by ENX04, we're able to make an extremely simple footprint for what's gonna be a very profitable farm. And the whole way that this works hinges around these zombie reinforcements. Since under certain conditions, zombies are able to spawn other zombies to help them out in a fight. And what's better yet, these zombie reinforcements ignore the mob cap. Meaning just like that, we're able to pile hundreds and hundreds of zombies into our farm. And and at that point, as long as you have a looting three and mending sword, we can use an auto clicker to stay at this farm for hours. And at that point, the only question is going to be, how do you store all that copper? I don't think I'm breaking any new ground by saying that netherite tools are a high value item, but getting a set of our own requires a lot of time and a lot of luck. So it'd be a shame if your friend's spare set just sat there collecting dust when we could use it instead. And to fix that, we have a pretty cheap solution. As you'll notice, enchanted stone tools look virtually indistinguishable from a netherite set, meaning if we were to make some decoys and swap them in, preferably named the same way as the previous pickaxe, then as long as they don't have advanced tool tips enabled, this facade should last long enough for us to trade out what we need. Ask any fisherman, bait works wonders. But today, instead of baiting guppies, we'll be trapping our friends instead. So why not leave your friend a gift in a chest like this? Now, what it is isn't important, but the key here is to make it look as legitimate as possible, down to the heartfelt message on the sign. Since the truth is that that sign covers up the red pixels of a trap chest. And then once they open it up, our trap gets put into motion. See, then the TNT under our sand or gravel ignites, breaks the signs that support us, and then let them fall into the abyss. And at that point, their items are as good as gone. I'd venture that in most people's worlds, horses don't get a lot of use. But what they lack is a form of travel, especially when compared to the elytra, they more than make up for as a status symbol. And that's even more true when they're fitted with a rare piece of horse armor. So to take your friend's prized steed down a peg, we might need to fill in a facade. By using dyed leather horse armor, we can get pretty close to the iron and gold variants that they're used to. And if you want to be extra dubious, then it is always possible to swap out their horse for one that has the same pattern. And that way we can steal both their stats and their status. If you've got access to the top of the nether roof, then you got yourself a food farm. Since for only 30 minutes of your time, you could build this extremely simple hoglin farm. And that way we're getting ourselves both cooked pork chops and leather too. And probably the best part about this is that it requires no complicated redstone or anything like that. Literally all we're doing is just scaring away the hoglins with warped fungus. And then by setting the light level of the farm so that only the hoglins can spawn, we're ensuring that when we go up top here, we'll have enough food to supply multiple players on the server with literal food for years. The best way to pull off something evil is to pretend it's a good deed. I mean, even the Greeks knew that was a good idea. So to use our form of a Trojan horse, we'll need to secure a creeper companion. From there, lead it towards your friend's chest, have it explode, and then, when you offer to help put the items back, simply pinch the ones you'd like to keep. I mean, they'll be caught in such a frenzy that they likely won't notice a few items gone missing, especially if the creeper happened to explode a tower of chests like this one. So it's a win-win. We seem like a good friend, all the while we pull off our heist. In recent updates, iron farms have never been easier to build. Since in the past we might have had to spend all the time to place down these doors in a specific way, now an entire iron farm could be kept to this small design. And as Raceworks shows off, we can build this iron farm design in five minutes. Which that little of a time investment is able to get us 300 to 400 ingots per hour. So unless you start building with iron blocks, there's hardly even a need to go past this rate. It's really a no-brainer to have one of these in your world. Now, if we're being honest, taking the stuff out of their chest is not the difficult part. But hiding those items once you get them is a bit trickier. So to make sure we get away 
with our findings, it's worth your while to take a trip up to the stars. See, chest and shoulder boxes are rendered as entities, meaning if we place some of these up past the clouds next to build height, they won't be rendered from the ground below, giving us a pretty foolproof vault. Just make sure your friend doesn't follow you up that way. Otherwise, our stolen stuff might end up in the wrong hands. Or would it be the right hands? Honestly, I don't know. Instead of trading with your villagers in the overworld, you should trade with them in the end, for the simple reason that if you get a villager set up like this, and then use the end teleporter gateways, we're able to easily keep trading with the same villager without it ever timing out. And the best part about this user design is that we don't actually have to break bedrock to do this. But rather, we just flip the trap door, activate the water source, and then trade with the villager as we're getting teleported between the two different spots. That alone makes it completely possible to keep trading with this villager as many times as we want, since it bugs it out and it'll never have to restock. So while it might take some time to set this all up, this definitely could be a design that saves you time in the future. Camouflage is a time-honored tactic. I mean, why else would chameleons exist? It's basic science, folks. So if you don't have the resources yet for an invisibility potion, this could be the time for some lizard brain ingenuity. And the execution is surprisingly simple. All we need to do is swap out our skin for one of the many camouflage ones you can find online, preferably one that actually blends in with our base and doesn't stick out, and then we can sneak behind them while they're inside to loot the goods. Is it ridiculous? Yeah, absolutely. But it worked for Technoblade, so that's enough proof for me. Just, uh, please hold the sneak key while you do it. Villager trading is a lucrative concept, and more often than not, the person who gets the best trades winds up being the richest on the server. So to stop your friend from getting decked out in mending enchanted armor, we'll need to use a doppelganger of our own. No offense to them, but the villagers all look alike. A bold statement, I know. I Meaning we could change out their librarian for one that looks the exact same and play it off pretty easily. And hey, we could even claim that there was a glitch with the server's data that caused it to reset. Which might be cruel, but don't worry, we've got our own trades to worry about now. And with that folks, YouTube thinks that you might like this video, so see if they're right and have a good one, alright?